it, the time is now 3 p.m. and we will call um, this meeting of the Conroe ISD School Safety and Security Committee to order. Appreciate your presence today and we're going to do our best to keep moving and respect everyone's time. Um, our first item on the agenda is to consider the approval of the minutes from the school safety and security meeting back in May 27th, 2020. I know those minutes have been uh, emailed out to everyone and I would entertain a motion for approval at this time. So moved. So moved by Mr. Moore, a second? Second. All right, second by Mr. Williams. Any conversation or corrections that need to be made uh, surrounding the minutes? All right, hearing none. Uh, I'll ask at this time for a vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please give a wave. Anyone opposed, please let your voice be heard. Okay, that will pass. We're moving on. Item two, receive information regarding how the district continues to respond to COVID-19. And uh, as I heard Mr. McCord mention earlier in another meeting, um, when you really start writing all these things down and looking at it, this is uh, quite an amazing thing um, that, that we are working through. And we're fortunate to have um, such wonderful people leading the way and um, not the least of which is uh, Ms. Barbara Robertson, who is uh, our coordinator of, our, of health services, um, kind of the lead nurse, uh, if you will, and our chief communicator with um, all of our local health entities and has just done an absolutely wonderful job. And it feels like she ought to be approaching the uh, end of this marathon she's been running. And unfortunately we are um, just beginning. And so uh, we do appreciate all that she's done for us so far and we'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Robertson and followed by Mr. McCord. Thank you, Dr. Knoll. As an update, the positivity rate in Texas is at 13.57%, which is still uh, quite high, meaning that there is a widespread spread community uh, spread of COVID-19. Uh, yesterday, there were 5,839 new cases in Texas and 95 new cases in Montgomery County. We continue to uh, get reports in CISD of employees and students with positive cases and illness and we work through those as they occur through our COVID workforce response. Our nurses will be returning to campuses tomorrow on Wednesday uh, along with our teaching staff and we have developed clinic procedures and protocols for triaging ill students and employees during the day. Uh, campuses are beginning to identify isolation areas for ill students where we will uh, keep them and care for them until their parents are able to pick them up. We have delivered PPE um, to the campuses. This is um, what we have purchased in CISD as well as what has been allocated to us from the state. That includes adult and student disposable mask, cloth adult, adult mask, face shields, and limited amounts of gloves. We're still waiting for our allocation from the state for gloves and for the non-contact thermometers. Uh, we have requested assistance from Montgomery County OEM to place an, an order with the state for N95 respirators for clinic personnel and athletic trainers that uh, care for ill students and staff. We do have protocols in place to, um, to track ill students and employees. Um, health services and CISD campus nurses will be working each of these cases as they come up to give guidance on safe return to work and school timelines and um, for anyone that's uh, needing to be isolated or quarantined due to close contact. That's my update. All right, uh, Mr. Barton, could you uh, release the screen and I will uh, need the screen just for a second, Ethan. So, hello everybody. I will cover some of the mitigation initiatives and strategies we've had and it's been a co coordinated effort, a lot of people working and contributing over months to get to this point. We appreciate their efforts. I'm not usually big on reading bullet points, but I think in this case, I'm just gonna go down the line and just briefly mention some of the things. And I put number one on purpose, and that is every campus has a wellness manager. And the wellness, wellness manager may be an assistant principal, it could be an associate principal. In a few cases, it is the building principal, but it is a person that reports directly to Dr. Knoll. And their job is to be uh, the safeguarding person on campus to make sure that we are following with fidelity all the fundamentals that are important 
for the mitigation and prevention of uh, communication of COVID-19. So really it starts with people. We spent a lot of time training these uh, fine individuals. They were chosen, chosen for their respectability on campus, their temperament and just ability to, uh, to deliver. So we're excited about the wellness managers. Our most important thing that we have are our people. We do have plans to e-mist or fog nightly to keep our buildings clean. We've made a huge commitment of money, effort, people, uh, equipment to get this done. And uh, custodial is leading the way. And so that is going to be a big commitment to keep people safe. We have hand sanitizers for every classroom and every shared work area. Hand sanitizing stations positioned at key points all throughout district campuses and buildings. So our custodial staff will replace and uh, fill disinfectant spray bottles as needed on a nightly basis. Uh, we've uh, worked together. We have ordered 200 desk-based sneeze guards already. We have 120 more that are in that we're giving to our nurses aides and nurses. And starting today, I'm proud to say, our CTE staff are working to create and build 400 more 24 by 24 uh, desk place shields for our staff throughout the district. We do have our employees directive to wear face masks. We're supplying face shields for people. Our students in third grade and up are required to wear a, a mask. I'm excited to know as to uh, really announce for the first time that as part of this process with the remote learning, we will have a help center for parents, guardians, and students and staff from 7.30 until 9. We have hand sanitizing stations that will be on buses. They will look like this, just as the ones are that are in the classrooms. Those are being installed as we speak. So we're excited about that. We do have plans to run the air conditioners on the buses, but we will have windows down so we can keep circulation good and keep people safe and healthy as possible. We've already increased the MERV rating on our building HVAC filters. The MERV rating is a rating that tells you how effective the filter is at filtering out virus particles. And we've already elevated our MERV rating uh, for every, uh, everywhere in the district. We have a COVID-19 check-in for staff, which is really neat. We've used since the early days of COVID-19 to make sure that people are safe entering the buildings and we can track and trace who has been in and where they have gone. Uh, we do have a COVID-19 check-in for parents and guardians to verify that students are okay. Those will go out on Sundays before the work weeks, before the school weeks. We're looking at the exact date that that will go out. We're still uh, considering when it is. It's, it's really built, it's ready to activate. We're just looking for the date. One thing that uh, Custodial has worked on and I'm excited about, on every campus we will have at least one touchless water fountain so that kids can bring a water bottle, they can have their water filled, without having to touch anything. Uh, child nutrition is working and we've created and purchased uh, these special IDs, we're printing them, that will allow for touchless purchase of food, whether it be at the curbside or the point of sale inside the building. Uh, we have created within technology a new app known as Car Riders, which will allow for a queue based system of pickup at the car rider line. And what that will do is allow us to release students to the car line without having them congregate at the exits of the building as really has done since uh, for, forever. So that's exciting. Daryl Idle's on point for that. We have a bus hub app that we've been using for years. We've continued development of that. We can keep kids in the classroom and release them when their buses arrive and thus limit the amount of kids that are at the points of egress throughout the building limiting contact. Uh, we're continuing our in-services, ongoing training, and we have an elaborate roadmap to reopening that will answer most any question a parent, guardian, student, or staff member may have. A lot of people have contributed to that. So those are some of the things that we're working on uh, to help mitigate COVID-19 and have a safe reopening and prepare for the ramp up. I need to screen back real quick, Mr. McCord. Okay. There you go, should be there now. Oh. All right, thank you, Mr. McCord. I know that we uh, appreciate that you sharing that. And uh, one of the things I want to just highlight to everybody is just a reminder about the school year is um, our struggle with the school year is going to be staff availability. 
And so that list that Mr. McCord shared, so much of that was um, really centered on, um, you know, how are we going to keep people safe? And, and in particular, our students, I mean, our, te our teachers, because if we end up with a lot of staff in quarantine, that's, that's what will really sabotage our school year. So we're, we're working hard uh, for that. And that's, that's what mo where most of that list has come from. So um, thank you for that report, Ms. McCord. And so now we'll move to item three that receive information about and provide input regarding the 2019, 2020 school safety and security grant. And we'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go first and then we'll uh, segue transition to Ethan. But in 2019, the district was lucky enough to receive a grant for $1 million as part of the Texas School Safety and Security Grant Program. And we are using this money, which needs to be spent by May 31st, 2021. And we're using it to just increase all of the aspects of safety uh, around our district. So we're going to talk and hit on the highlights of those. And if Mr. Barton, if you can transition to the next slide, and uh, Ethan is going to go over the details. Just uh, we're, we're working on obtaining digital radios, and we're transitioning from our analog radios to digital radios for a complete district-wide upgrade, blue emergency call stations to keep people, parents, staff, students, everyone safe in parking lots around our district, uh, a refresh of campus safety signage, We've added some campus perimeter fencing to keep children safe. And um, Mr. Barton will speak specifically also about Raptor software, hardware, what it is, how we use it, why it's so important, and why we need an upgrade. So with that, I'll transition. And Mr. Barton, you are on point. All right. uh, thank you, Mr. McCord. And um, as mentioned, with that million dollar grant, there's some specific areas that we're required to spend the money in. And we're going to go through where we have the money allocated as of right now and its intention with that. And the first was to make a, um, a complete and total district transition to digital radios. And so their purchase is going to be for 1,725 digital radios. So all campuses and all, all campuses will have digital radios. And the reason for this is, of course, there's better coverage. And we've, uh, we've added repeaters and, and needed places um, to increase that coverage. And no walking over communication between the campuses. And a good example of that would be kind of like your little golden triangle of campuses, Knox, Wilkerson, and Haley is a good example. When Haley is doing um, car rider dismissal, they're on a few channels to make that happen. And then Wilkerson and Knox had to kind of hear and listen to it. And the channels were, were all, well, they're walking over each other. So the digital licenses will remove that increased communication. Uh, they're more secure, and then it's, of course, again, it's a great upgrade for response to any incident or emergency. And then as part of that, all of the analog radios that we had in place, the vendor that we chose or that um, received the bid is taking those back as a credit. So we're able to return those um, and make the money go a little bit further. Um, that is it for the digital radios. Um, moving on to the blue call stations, um, as you can see here on the picture, that's one of the two that we already have existing. This one is outside of Moorhead Stadium. Um, the other one is um, at Wood Forest Stadium, and we're going to add 14 additional blue call stations. Um, that's what's planned for purchase with the grant funds, and the placements are going to be um, in, in areas such as auxiliary stadiums and high schools. Um, they're solar powered and cell driven, which means that they're not hardwired or anything. We can place them virtually anywhere it is that we feel that they're going to be needed. Um, instant contact to the Conroe ISD Police Department. Um, it's cloud-based archive system, captures, captures still pictures and audio kind of, best way to describe it is kind of how the iPhone takes a live picture. It takes a little bit of a video, but it's going to capture all that audio as well um, and can be taken um, off the cloud at any time. And the gentleman um, from CASE, the department or the organization that is selling them to us, he came out and gave us a demo of the one that was there um, at Moorhead. So I'm going to show you a short video um, that we were able to capture from that day of that working directly with our police department. Everybody can see that. just want to make sure that I'm, I'm good. Good? Okay. Corner of PISD, please. Testing one, two, three. And that was there. Um, I decided to do the filming on that real quick, so I wasn't able to capture the greatest video in the world. But as you can see, it, um, it's functioned there um, in helping. Um, he pushed the button. It connected to our police department immediately. 
Um, she was able to get on there. He told her, you know, hey, hit the PA thing. So she put in her code and then she was able to speak directly loud from the speaker there to everyone around. So um, they're, they're good things to have in place for any time of the day, even for students, parents, any community member that should be for, um, near one of those and, and need um, assistance immediately. Mr. Barber. Uh, yes, sir. So as a point of emphasis too on the blue, the blue phone, the, the dispatcher, anyone monitoring the uh, neighboring video cameras, they can use the uh, PA through the blue phones, through the blue uh, call tower to relay information to anyone in, in the neighboring parking lot, whether it be uh, serious or whatever the case may be. It gives us another way to communicate with people in the parking lot in some type of a situation. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and then um, as another part of the, the fundage, we've upgraded our signage for making sure that we're directing people to the main office. If you've been to any of our campuses, you probably have seen the, the red signs. They just look like a stop sign with some various language on there. These are the English version, and I'll just make sure that everybody does know that we, they are going to be, they're going to have the Spanish on them as well once they finally get out to the campuses. Um, these are going to go on the exterior doors, and so you'll see, and typically they're going to be on the ones with glass, and they're, they're going to be two-sided. This is going to be on the one facing outside, which is directing everyone to the main office um, to go through the identification and the visiting process that we have at each campus. And hopefully that is through the main office through that one, that one point, so we're using our secure vestibules as they are intended. And then the other side, the more important side, uh, or not the more important, one of the most important sides as you're gonna see here is on the other side of that, it's gonna be on the inside directing anyone that's at that door to not let anyone in. And um, that is a thing that's come up through our continuous uh, building inspections and our safety audits with Michael Ferguson is, is having uh, something out there. We know it's not gonna solve every problem, but at least every time we have a student or an adult that comes to that door, they're gonna see that sign and know that they should not let anybody in that door. Because if they can get in that door as an employee and they should be, they're gonna have a key or a badge to enter that door. And um, that's one thing that we're, we're hoping will prevent anything like anybody getting into our buildings um, that should not. Um, another portion of it, or the next portion is perimeter fencing, which is another important thing for school safety. And so campus perimeter fencing was addressed um, in needed areas. An example of that work right there is at Hauser Elementary. And one thing that I can say is, you know, it just looks like some black chain link fence, but um, fencing is very important. Not only is it important to keep things out that we don't want in, but it also is very important for keeping things in that we want in, mainly our students and our children, which are very important. Um, so the fencing also is a high priority there. And so that's just one example um, of that money being used for uh, fixing, upgrading, maintaining the perimeter fencing at our campuses. And moving on, Raptor, um, probably out of all of them, it, well it is, it's the one that's used on a daily basis at our campuses and is extremely important. Um, we're gonna be looking at doing a Raptor software and hardware upgrade. And I know that many of you have probably gone to our campuses and gotten your visitor badge, and so that's the, the software and the program that's used there at the campus. Um, Raptor is going through a software upgrade and it's gonna be one of those things to where what we have in place right now is no longer going to be um, serviced or um, helped or they're no, no longer gonna have that one, support that one, that's the word I'm looking for. And so we're gonna do the software upgrade and with the software upgrade that we do not have to pay for, we'll have to upgrade the hardware. And essentially the hardware is dealing with the scanners when you come in and they're scanning your ID into the system. And so we'll be looking, we'll be spending some funds on, on the hardware, the scanner upgrades um, for all of the campuses. Technology is going to have a big hand in that, making sure that all of our, our computers that use them um, have that hardware and software on there. And then the training is going to be provided for the, um, the support staff that uses those. And should be an easy transition from everything that Raptor has told us. Um, and just once we get everything in, we'll be able to move toward making that happen for our campuses. Uh, the benefits of Raptor, as you know, we're going to know exactly who is in the school at all times, when they've checked in, who they are visiting, and then where they're, they're, they're intended to go in the building. It'll all be on that visitor badge. Um, it also runs an instant automatic check against the National Sex Offender Registry. Um, it's custom alert based that we can set to how we see fit. And then notifications can be sent out via text message, email, 
um, and our calls to customize contacts there on each individual campus. And then you can also create campus-specific reports um, that that end user there at the campus will be able to generate should they need it. Um, and so then the remaining budget funds, when all is said and done, after all the purchases that we intend to make, um, there should be an approximate amount of $54,000 left. And so um, a, a function of this district level safety committee meeting is um, we're gonna seek some guidance or some input um, on what you guys feel um, the, the, the money should be used for or those remaining funds should be used for in regard to, to school safety. Um, and just know that there's there's certain areas. And Mr. McCord, do you want me to show those areas where we have to spend the money? You can if you want to. Okay. Uh, and um, as a part of the grant, it tells us that you know it has to be spent with ex on exterior doors with push bars, metal detectors at school entrances. Um, erected vehicle barriers are the bollards that you see out front, and then security systems that monitor and record school entrances, which essentially is where we kind of fit everything that we've made purchase in there. It all Number four is kind of the umbrella of the purchases for school safety. Um, Campus-wide active shooter alarm systems, um, separate from fire alarms, and then two-way uh, two radio systems, perimeter fencing, bullet-resistant glass or film school entrances, and then um, door locking systems. Those are the areas that the grant says that we can spend the money toward. So um, if you have any input, um, we can hear that now, or of course, at any point in time after the meeting, you can always email me or give me a phone call, and um, we will take those suggestions and move forward with the purchase for the, or with the remaining funds, excuse me. All right, thank you, Ethan. I have a quick question if that's yes, okay. Uh, it just relates to the campus blue signs. Uh, some campuses have multiple parking lots. Is, does that mean that there's a blue um, emergency uh, transmitter in each of those locations or just one per campus? Amy, the plan for now is to provide one for the main parking lot for each high school and then one for the shared, the large fine arts athletics area where students congregate so we have seven schools, 14 total. That is the plan for now. Uh, later, we could, we could choose to add some more. That is the plan for now. Thank you, that's a great question. And, and we had and talked I, about, can I ahead. mention, we talked about doing one, if we have enough money, over by the Bach Auditorium at McCullough. Yeah. And to be clear, Ethan, I'm working off the top of my head. They're 14 some odd thousand dollars a piece, or am I dreaming that, Ethan? You are correct. I believe that the actual amount when we broke it down is $14,400 each. So we have money left. That could be something that we do. It could. Yes, sir. And I think for the most part, each campus kind of has those areas they know that are the main congregation areas that so will look different based on the school. Um, I would like to circle back and, and give us an opportunity to ask any questions regarding COVID or regarding general safety. I know, you know, this time we spend so much time talking about COVID, but the reality and, and through Ethan's presentation is none of the other safety concerns surrounding school have gone away. <laughs> they're all still there and they're all still at the forefront. And so um, I will remind everyone that we are in open session right now. And so um, while I invite any and all questions, I just, I would make that caveat that if there is something that, um, that we can't share an open session that, that should only be discussed in a closed session. We would, we would answer that question for you in the future in a closed uh, meeting of this committee, a, a closed session of this committee. So uh, any questions uh, regarding COVID or um, the, the safety and security um, grant? Okay. Well, all right. Well, um, our date and time for next meeting, Sarah, do we have that confirmed um, on a calendar? I do not have that information yet. Okay. No. I don't well, know if Ethan or Mr. McCord might have that to share. I don't. We haven't talked about it, but I know Dr. Null, just me, just thinking out loud mm -hmm. um, with our intention and when we're going to expect students back, maybe. Um, 
around mid-November or something like that, because we have to do one in the first semester, we have to do one second semester, and then one in the summer. Those are the requirements. So maybe a little bit of lag time after we're expecting to accept students. So perhaps a window uh, in the between Thanksgiving and the winter break, would that be uh, an acceptable um, use? And if, if the committee is okay, I, I would prefer that we would, you know, perhaps give us a month or two to, to get a little closer to that, and then we can share a date and time. I, I would hate, um, if, if there's no lessons we've learned around here in the last five months, it's uh, once you start planning out more than about, I don't know, two hours, uh, you're gonna change your plan. <laughs> so uh, I think we, we might all just be best served if, we, um, if we'll identify that window, and then we will come forward to you with a, uh, a firm date and time in the future, if that's acceptable. Okay. All right. Well, at this time, um, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. This is right. Ray Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Sanders. Second. All right, Mr. Moore, thank you. All right. Appreciate your, your attendance today, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you all back here later into the fall semester. Thank you.